Hello everyone, welcome to UGC 112, World Civilizations 2. This is lecture 22, Latin America Gains Its Freedom. So at the very beginning of the semester, think all the way back then, uh, we talked about how the Portuguese started to explore in hopes of expanding their trade, right? We saw the expeditions uh, funded by Henry the Navigator, briefly mentioned uh, Bartolomeu Gius, who got around the Cape of Good Hope, but was forced to come back. These, of course, were aided by new technology like the Caravel. And then we mentioned Vasco da Gama and his trips going around the Cape of Good Hope, stopping off in the Swahili city-states, setting up forts there to help control trade. Uh, this is Forte Jesus in Mombasa. And of course, da Gama continued on to India, where they would try to control trade there as well. Uh, and also, we're trying to convert people. This is uh, the Basilica do Bom Jesus in Goa, uh, a city that they held actually until 1961. Uh, you can see Goa here in India. So they actually had uh, a little bit of India, not just, you know, Britain had the main subcontinent. Goa remained in Portuguese hands until 1961. From India, the Portuguese, of course, continued on into the East Indies, where they took Malacca in 1511, as you'll remember. And we went into pretty great detail in, for Portuguese exploration in that part of the world. What we didn't discuss as much was that Portuguese also began to colonize the New World with Brazil and South America in 1500. I know I mentioned it, you know, just as kind of like a passing note. So now let's kind of look at it a little bit more in depth, uh, you know, and then what would happen. And of course, obviously, the Portuguese were really happy when they came to Brazil because they got to see, you could see the, there's the natives there, uh, there are animals like monkeys, uh, some birds, and of course, the famous Brazilian dragon. Look at that. There's a Brazilian dragon right there. Uh, and of course, still Brazilian dragons around. Here's a modern day Brazilian dragon. How terrifying is that? Look at it. Ah, okay. We should get away from that. It's too scary. Some of the, the goods that were especially uh, prevalent in Brazil were Brazil wood, which was used for red dye, and once sugar was introduced to the New World, because remember, sugar was not native to the New World, it was Columbus who brought it over on his second voyage in 1493, but once it came into Brazil, Brazil was a very uh, big producer of sugar. So here we can see the Portuguese colonization of Brazil early on, um, and then moving inwards uh, later. And Columbus is a good segue, because it wasn't just the Portuguese who were active in the New World. You have all this red up around here. Uh, remember Columbus in 1492, and then his return voyages. Um, he was working for Spain. We briefly mentioned... Hernán Cortés, who conquered the Aztecs from around 1518 to 1520, as well as Francisco Pizarro, who conquered the Incas from 1532 to 1533. So there are those Aztecs uh, defeated by Cortés, and then down here are the Incas defeated by Pizarro. So over the rest of the 16th century, Spain really began to expand in the New World. They would control, you know, Caribbean islands like Cuba. There we are, right around here. So the Caribbean islands, they would control Cuba, Puerto Rico. Also had a presence in Florida. Of course, had Mexico up into California, Texas. And virtually all of Central America and most of South America besides Brazil that was being held by the Portuguese. 
And it was pretty much this way uh, up until the early 19th century. You know, th this was basically the breakdown of the New World, of course, obviously. You know, the English would come here. Um, some of this would be claimed by different peoples as well. But roughly the same map holds true until early 19th cent uh, the early 19th century. Now, what could be happening in the early 19th century that would throw, um, you know, the New World into chaos? Not surprisingly, it's this man here. Uh, there is Napoleon, who in 1807 invaded with his armies into Portugal. As a response of Napoleon's invasion, the royal family and its court of about 15,000 people fled to the richest Portuguese colony, which was Brazil. And this is them leaving in December of 1807, um, you know, right as uh, Napoleon's forces are coming to the coast. And from 1808 to 1821, uh, Joao, John, the sixth, ruled his empire from Brazil. Now, notice those years, 1808 to 1821. He remained in Brazil even after Napoleon was defeated at Waterloo. In fact, in 1815, just months after Waterloo, Brazil was raised from being just a colony of Portugal to being a united kingdom with Portugal. So kind of like what we see in uh, Great Britain, where there's Scotland and England to form the United Kingdom, we see a Portuguese United Kingdom with Portugal and Brazil um, in 1815, and John is going to stay there. Uh, so Brazil no longer at this point, from 1815 on, it's not just a controlled market anymore. Remember how we talked about colonies are controlled markets? Uh, it could trade with others besides Portuguese merchants now. Because it was part of that United Kingdom, it was, it, it had gained a lot of freedom that way, uh, and still linked. Uh, the ruler was living there. Brazil improved commercially through the building of factories, banks, military academies, uh, medical schools, and also culturally, uh, with the opening of things like botanical gardens, an art academy, and an opera house. And this is actually the Royal Art Academy in Rio de Janeiro. Now, the fact that the king was ruling from Brazil made a lot of people in Portugal upset. Um, you know, they thought the king, the Portuguese king, should be living in Portugal. And so they revolted, and John was forced to return to Portugal. While leaving Brazil for Portugal again, John decided to leave his son, Pedro, as viceroy over Brazil. Viceroy is basically someone who rules in place of a king, right? Uh, there you can see the word king. So, in place of the king, Dom Pedro should be, you know, subordinate. So... But that's not really what happens. In 1822, there were some revolts spreading around Brazil. Pedro decided to declare himself emperor of the empire of Brazil. Now, he didn't just, I mean, he declared this, right? And he was actually very successful in doing this, though, because the Portuguese recognized uh, the independence of Brazil in 1825. So it's not just, you know, some lip service here. Brazil separates in 1825 is an independent country under uh, the son of John, now Dom Pedro the first. And Dom Pedro was a constitutional monarch who allowed elections and free speech. He also supported the idea of freeing many Brazilian slaves. But he was not able to get this passed. Uh, there was a lot of resistance, as there is um, often 
when slavery is involved, people are going to fight hard for it. Uh, so he was never able to free the, the slaves of Brazil. During his reign, Brazil also stopped uh, the practice of mercantilism. Remember, that's where uh, the state controls the economy. And in doing so, he opened up Brazilian ports to free trade. In 1826, uh, Pedro was given the choice. He could remain emperor of Brazil, or he could become the king of Portugal. And he actually chose to remain emperor of Brazil, uh, and his brother would become king of Portugal. So he viewed Portugal, or he viewed Brazil as actually more, you know, profitable, you know, a greater asset than Portugal itself. Unfortunately, it didn't, things didn't work out too well for him. Uh, in 1831, there was a bunch of riots in Brazil, and he was actually forced to abdicate his throne, uh, and he would then return to Portugal and overthrew his absolutist brother in favor of his own liberal daughter. So, forced to abdicate from Brazil, returns to Portugal, overthrows his absolutist brother, puts his own daughter on uh, the throne of Portugal. And he would end up dying in 1834. Um, but before he did so, he wrote one final letter to Brazil that was a strong argument about freeing the slaves. So throughout his whole life, he was working towards freeing uh, the Brazilian slaves. When Pedro I was uh, forced to abdicate, the throne passed on to his son, Pedro, who became Dom Pedro II. He was five years old at the time in 1831, so he ruled with a regent, and he was crowned uh, in 1841 as the actual emperor then. So 1841, he gains his full power. His reign really... Uh, marked a period of stabilization for Brazil, uh, and it led to economic prosperity. He worked with elected officials, and after fighting against slavery throughout most of his reign, uh, it was actually finally abolished in 1888. So it took a long time in Brazil. That's even after the United States, you know, and like I said, Pedro I was fighting for it, you know, as early as the 1820s, and it wasn't until 1888 uh, that Dom Pedro II was actually able to get slavery abolished. Unfortunately, in doing so, it upset a lot of many of the elites in uh, Brazil, and these elites convinced the army to overthrow Pedro II uh, despite his popularity with the people and, you know, being very prestigious around the world. He was a, he was a noted figure throughout the entire world. Uh, they still, uh, you know, these elites got the army to overthrow him. And so they overthrew him and a democracy was established. And you can see there are those lovely quotes there. Uh, because this isn't a democracy at all. It's really an oligarchy controlled by those uh, Brazilian elites who would have been mainly Portuguese by birth. And this is what slowly has evolved into Brazil's modern government, um, this oligarchic type democracy, um, still very, very oligarchic leaning. Now, once Dom Pedro II is overthrown, the history books will tell you that he fled to Europe and then died in 1891. But I'm pretty sure that he actually moved to Hollywood and is now Jeff Daniels. I mean, look at this. It's uncanny. I don't know which one's which. I think this is... That's Don Pedro, right? Don Pedro II's there. Jeff Dan... I can't tell. Yeah. So, you know, believe the history books if you want. I'm pretty sure he's Jeff Daniels. <laughs> 
So unlike Brazil's peaceful separation from Portugal, Spain's colonies had to fight in order to break free. And part of that was due to the social structure within uh, a Spanish colony. On top, you had uh, the Peninsulares. These were Spaniards born in Spain, uh, but living in the New World. Then you had the Criollos, or Creoles as we call them in English, Spaniards born in the New World, but both of their parents were Spanish and were born, um, yeah, were fully Spanish. Their only, you know, differentiation between them and the Peninsulares was that they were born in the New World. Below them, you had uh, the Mestizos. These were mixed-blooded people, the child of one European parent and one Native American. And then below them, you had uh, the mulattoes, who were a child, or who were the children of one European parent and one African parent. Of course, there were also Native Americans and African slaves, uh, but they didn't have any rights in these colonies. Among the people who did have rights, the lowest, the people with the least amount of rights, were the mulattoes, uh, then uh, the mestizos, and Roughly three quarters to, or three fifths to three quarters of the population was either Native American or uh, mestizo. So this is, you know, a vast majority of people with either no rights or very little rights. Now the Creoles had, did have some rights, you know, a pretty good amount, but most of them were relatively poor, and there were roughly around 3.5 million Creoles in the Spanish New World. Then going, working our way back up, finally, the Peninsulares, since they were born in Spain, were the ones who were on top. They were the aristocrats. Um, that meant that they controlled the import and export of goods, uh, trade within a colony, the mining industry, which was massive. Uh, there was a ton of silver in the 16th and century, 17th centuries. And even despite sucking out all that silver, uh, in the 18th century, there was still enough silver to fill a galleon, which is a really large trading ship, a year in the 18th century. So in the 18th century, they were still able to take enough silver out each year to fill one of these massive trade ships, a galleon. So in the fifth, from 1550 to the 1700s, Spanish colonies became more economically independent, uh, in part because uh, the Board of Trade which was founded in 1503 by Isabella, had become too bureaucratic and couldn't really effectively control the colonial markets anymore. So they had, you know, this board of trade, but there was just too much red tape and it lost control over the colonial markets. This meant that the colonies really began to produce their own goods and their own food, uh, instead of buying Spanish goods, they would then trade with each other. So we see this, you know, the Spanish New World kind of separating economically from Spain. In 1717, um, the Spain tried to make the colonies more dependent on the Board of Trade, which is also called the uh, Casa de Contratación, uh, by moving it from Seville to Cadiz. And so thus, thus they were trying to separate it from the bureaucrats. Um, you know, 
hopefully if you remove those bureaucrats, you'll be able to have the Board of Trade being the ones in control again. Um, but by 1790, this Board of Trade was banished altogether. So that, you know, Casa de Contratación completely gone by 1790. Then there came the reign of Carlos III. Um, obviously, this is before the uh, Board of Trade was abolished. Carlos III, he really tried to make the colonies dependent on Spain through different types of reforms. Uh, some of these reforms included breaking up the large vice royalties into smaller ones. A uh, vice royality is just ruled by viceroys, you know, what we saw um, Dom Pedro I was supposed to be. Uh, these are people who are like governors ruling in place of the king. Um, so there were these really large vice, uh, vice royalties, and they were broken up under Carlos III into much smaller ones, the idea being that they'd be more manageable then. And here is Carlos III. Uh, I think he looks a lot like uh, the Popeye character Eugene the Jeep. Again, it's uncanny. Um, you know, I mean, maybe this was a picture of Eugene the Jeep the whole time, and then I just put Carlos III here. Uh, but yeah, they look freakishly similar. So here you can kind of get a sense of some of the vice uh, vice royalties there were. Uh, you can see New Granada right up there. Um, there's Rio uh, de la Plata there. And these, there was free trade allowed. Uh, you know, there were built-in benefits for the Spanish merchants and shippers. So, free trade existed, but it still was leaning heavily towards uh, the Spanish merchants. Local goods could no longer really compete because of, you know, the benefits towards the Spanish merchants. And slowly they were beginning to be forced out of the world market. So, you know, what we saw before the reign of Carlos III were... The colonies just basically relied upon themselves. You know, they trade amongst themselves. Um, the the quote unquote free trade that was heavily benefiting the Spanish trades basically forced them out of um, the markets. They their their prices were just not as good as the Spanish prices, uh, and they could no longer compete. Colonies also were then compelled to make certain products for uh, the overseas markets that would benefit Spain. So no longer would these colonies have, you know, large economies with many different uh, goods. Instead, they became really focused on certain types of trade, uh, which when we talk, remember when we talked about imperialism, we mentioned West Africa really, really basically relied on the slave trade and how that was bad um, because you don't want to rely on just one good. Spain basically forced the colony, uh, its vice, uh, vice royalties, into um, becoming one product economies. For example, New Granada right up here um, was especially known for its coffee. Cuba would make sugar. So there's coffee from New Granada. Cuba would make sugar. Rio de la Plata, modern-day Argentina, would produce things based on cows like hides, leather, salted beef. Of course, Rio de la Plata, with the name de la Plata meaning silver, uh, New Spain, which was Mexico, and Peru, also would then supply silver because that's where the silver mines were. Um, here you could see some reales uh, from a shipwreck. So these are Spanish reales, uh, reales taken from 
uh, the new world. Because of this, local client, local trade declined, you know, from 1778 to 1788, and trade between Spain and its colonies increased 700 percent. So these reforms that Carlos was putting through um, really made the colonies dependent upon Spain economically again. And yeah, this was the type of trade that Spain controlled and thus profited from uh, the most. You know, the Spanish trade, or this uh, silver trade, I mean. Okay, so I've already mentioned this a couple times. So a viceroy, obviously, is the one who's governing uh, a viceroyalty. And so each viceroy had a council of advisors called an audiencia. And this council was mainly made up of peninsulares. Um, from 1751 to 1775, only 13% of uh, the people on these audiencias were uh, Cre uh, Creoles. And not surprisingly, this upset the Creoles. Uh, because there were more of them in the New World than there were Peninsulares. By the 18th century, uh, the defenses of the colonies needed to be upgraded. Uh, it's, it had been, you know, Spain had been in the New World for, you know, centuries at this point. Um, the defenses needed to be upgraded, and who's going to pay for that? Well, it's going to be. Uh, the colonists. So Spain expected the colonists to be the ones who paid for this uh, through taxes. So here's a, a quick little re recap of why trouble begin was brewing in uh, the Spanish New World. Spain had attempted to regain control of colonial commerce, right? Uh, this resulted in the destruction of the local colonial trade system that had, you know, kind of developed uh, as the Spanish system had broken down initially. Locals could no longer compete with Spanish goods in the local or world markets. Uh, the Creoles didn't play much of a role in governing the countries, or, you know, the, the colonies. The mestizos and the mulattoes were denied many rights, and the native and slaves, uh, the natives and the slaves, really had no rights at all. And then finally, you add on top of that the fact that the colonies were now being forced to pay for the upgrades to their defense. Uh, there are a lot of different types of people here upset uh, with Spanish rule, and so what we see is a wave of revolts, and this is going to just be the first wave of revolts. Uh, in Peru in 1780, uh, there was a man named Jose Gabriel uh, Condorcanqui, who claimed to be a descendant of the Incan royal family, uh, and began to call himself Tupac Amaru II. Um, Tupac Amaru I was the last Incan ruler, so he's taking on this title, now claiming to be uh, the legitimate ruler of the former Incan uh, Empire down in South America. Besides being the heir of Tupac Amaru I, Tupac Amaru II is also the namesake of the rapper Tupac Shakur. So Tupac Amaru II led a force of Native Americans and uh, Castas, which was a general term for people of mixed origins. So no matter what, it, it didn't matter if you were a mestizo or a mulatto, you were considered a casta. And that was the general term for you. And with this force of Native Americans and Castas, uh, he was very successful uh, in 
you know, causing havoc in the interior of the country. Uh, this included capturing uh, the governor of Peru uh, and having the governor's slave then execute uh, him. Because of this revolt, the Spanish sent colonial troops, uh, which were people from Spain, as well as loyal natives and loyal castas as well, uh, from Cusco to uh, Lima. And there we can see there's our Lima right down there, um, and there's Cusco there. So they sent you know, troops from Cusco out to Lima, and the rebellion was crushed. Uh, Tupac Amaru is beheaded, uh, and this is all after watching his entire family and the captains of his army uh, being executed. So, successful early on, but crushed uh, in 1781. Here we can see um, some colonial troops there. Uh, these would have been the ones who put down the... Um, you know, the revolt, and, yeah, you know, wearing the, the traditional Spanish army garb. So, in New Granada now, uh, in 1781, the Viceroy decided to raise the taxes, right? The There's New Granada again, right up there. Decided to raise the taxes because... You know, they were being expected to pay for these uh, defensive upgrades. The peasants and the workers of New Granada decide then to elect a, a commune. And this was like a, a central committee. Uh, and their purpose was uh, to lead a revolt. So these peasants and these workers, you know, elect this committee to, you know, take charge of leading a revolt. And thus we see that the revolutionaries in New Granada began to call themselves the Comuneros. We can see one here, right? Comuneros, 1781. Um, they formed an army of Native American soldiers, as well as Costas, uh, but the generals who were controlling these armies uh, were Creoles. So we have these Spaniards, you know, who were just born in the New World, the Creoles, leading these armies of Native American soldiers as well as Costas. They marched on the capital of Bogota, and they took it. Uh, the city didn't really have the resources to resist uh, this army of natives and costas marching on them and the government was forced to give in to the demands of this revolt that meant that lower taxes uh, as well as they were going to share the power at least with uh, the Creoles leading the army because they got what they wanted the rebel army decided to disband and the government said that everyone would be pardoned. Once the army was disbanded, you know, despite this pardon, the government then raised an army itself, collected taxes, captured all of the leaders of the Comuneros, and imprisoned them for life. So, not pardoned at all. Uh, it just bought the government time to form their own army in order to, you know, strike back at those who led uh, the uprising. As with Brazil, uh, Napoleon's empire in Europe also had deep impacts on the Spanish New World. You remember in 1807, Napoleon's armies invaded Portugal, causing the royal family to flee to Brazil. Well, Spain was allied with Napoleon to let them, to let him and his troops go through their territory, but Napoleon was not really a great ally, uh, 
because as he was, you know, marching through Spain to get to Portugal, uh, he decided that he wanted not just Portugal, but in fact all of the Iberian Peninsula for himself. For that reason, he forced Ferdinand VII to abdicate his throne as king and replace him with his own brother, Joseph. And you can see here is Ferdinand VII replaced with Joseph. And we talked about Ferdinand VII uh, a little bit when we talked about the revolutions. Um, Spain would fight a very intense, long war trying to drive Napoleon out. Uh, this was that part where, remember how I said that Napoleon was never really successful in Spain? Uh, that's because Spanish were constantly trying to revolt away from uh, Napoleon and France. Uh, never accepted Joseph Bonaparte as their king. Um, but by trying to resist Napoleon uh, constantly, Spain was greatly weakened itself. And this weakened Spain... Uh, the fact that it was, you know, taken over by Napoleon uh, led to the second wave of revolts. Um, from roughly 1815 to 1826, we see, um, yeah, this, this wave come up because Spain is in its weakened state. Um, colonies basically from Mexico to Argentina are going to revolt. Like earlier, uh, the Costas, those mixed-race those mixed race people, as well as natives, made up the bulk of the soldiers, whereas the, the Creoles were the generals. So the main armies were made up of mixed-race people and natives, but the Creoles, the, you know, the Spanish people but born in the New World, were the generals. You can see here uh, Simon Bolivar, uh, who sometimes is referred to as the George Washington of Latin America. Um, the textbook calls him that. Um, he was in uh, New Granada, and then uh, Jose San Martin, who was uh, ruling Argentina and Peru, or not ruling, but revolting from Argentina and Peru, um, and had in fact fought against Napoleon for Spain earlier, uh, Jose San Martin. We see them uh, uniting here. Uh, whoop. No, good. Don't want to get there yet. There's Simon Bolivar. Uh, there's Jose San Martin. Bernardo, Bernardo O'Higgins just wants to jump into this. Uh, here's Bernardo O'Higgins. He was an Irish grand, he had an Irish grandfather uh, who had moved to South America and fought in uh, Chile. Uh, along with the help of uh, Jose San Martin. But again, here we see uh, a European. These are all European people, ethnically. Uh, they've just been born in the New World. <clears throat> and then there's Agustin uh, de Iturbide in Mexico. Um, and here you can see the pioneer of the one-glove look. There's his one glove, and not wearing it the other. Uh, so this is years before Michael Jackson did it. So these revolts led by these different men, these different Creoles, uh, were very successful. Uh, Spain was too weak to really put these down, uh, and so each little bit, you know, is able to break free. But there was really no unity among these new states. Um, also, because they just kind of revolted, there was really no plan on how to govern these new territories, um, these new you know independent states uh, without the old Spanish system. Uh, and so without any real plan, what kind of happened was the Creoles just kind of assumed the place that the old peninsulares had, and they basically just rule, began to rule like the Peninsulares had. So the Creoles just took the place of the Peninsulares and used the system against everybody else who had helped them 
um, you know, gain freedom. Because of this, conditions really didn't improve much for most mestizos and most mulattoes. And it was because of this that democracy never really was, was well established in the Latin American countries. Um, you know, without having a plan on what to do after your revolt, just filling in the old power structures made it so that democracy never really settled in. Um, instead, what we see are the foundations of oligarchies or dictatorships. Um, yeah, you know, so the Creoles leading either as oligarchs or dictators, um, which greatly saddened um, Simone Bolivar. Uh, he had hoped that, you know, the Spanish America would create a federation, uh, much like the United States, um, never really happened. So he ended up actually becoming the dictator of Gran Colombia, uh, after the a constitution could not be agreed upon even in his own, um, little country. So Simone Bolivar, um, yeah, you know, wanted that you know, that federated, that confederated Spanish America, much like the United States, in the end of it, because nothing was happening and no constitution could be agreed upon, even in his own um, little area, became dictator of Gran Colombia. Bernardo Higgins, who we saw, he would become the dictator of Chile. Agustin de uh, Iturbide became the emperor of Mexico. It was also really common in these new states to begin to fight with each other. So, you know, each side fighting with each other. Or to have civil wars uh, within their own country. Um, here we see uh, the Argentine Civil War. And this whole kind of system of, you know, fighting each other, fighting the civil civil wars within their borders, created a lot of instability in the region. Um, you know, we saw that they weren't united with each other. Uh, they had this power structure of oligarchs or dictators. Um, and thus, what we see is what is basically what we call neo-colonialism. Starting in the late 19th century, foreign companies, especially British and companies from the United States, began to invest in Latin America. What they would do is they would build things like railroads and other infrastructure, and this helped develop Latin American industries. You know, things like farming, ranching, mining, um, but these investors were the ones who began to own the businesses and they gained control of these industries and basically economically Latin American countries were back to being in the state of being colonies, right? Um, you have these foreigners, this time not a foreign government, but instead foreign companies uh, coming in and controlling different industries because they're the ones who are investing in it, they're the ones who own it, and so they're the ones who are profiting from it. Here we can see, um, you know, one of the products, especially uh, found in Latin America, was uh, rubber. Uh, foreigners wanted raw materials like rubber so that they could make many different products. There's also oil. Um, the New World had a great supply of this, uh, especially the Spanish New World. And because of these new industries that were coming around, um, cities began to grow and 
to prosper with these uh, newer industries. Slavery had begun to disappear in Latin America, but prejudices remained. Um, sorry, this last one, this is Rio um, there, and this is Buenos Aires. Um, yeah, slavery had begun to disappear in Latin America basically because of all those revolutions, right? The, many of the people were working uh, in the army, so uh, slavery did lose its grip in Latin America, but many of the prejudices still remain, especially uh, since, you know, the, the people who were ruling were Creoles, so they were Europeans, right? Um, at least ethnically Europeans. Um, and so the prejudices could be seen in, uh, in the hiring of the jobs uh, within these industries. Instead of hiring uh, Native Americans or, you know, locals of African descent or even mulattoes and mestizos, what these companies and the government of these uh, countries decided to do was to encourage people uh, to immigrate from Europe in order to work in these new jobs. Not surprisingly, these immigrants became supporters of the political elite and the business elites, uh, and that slowly began to change um, throughout Latin America. Uh, you know, as it, it just kind of reinforced this idea of, um, you know, who's in power uh, and a really, a, a, a racial divide uh, in many senses. With foreign um, interests so heavily uh, present in Latin America, this also meant that there was a rise in gunboat diplomacy. And again, we looked at gunboat diplomacy when we talked about Japan. Uh, remember how Commodore Matthew Perry forced open uh, the Japanese to force them to trade with the United States? Basically, different foreign governments uh, would use gunboat diplomacy uh, or even covert missions uh, in order to protect the interests of you know, their businesses, their companies, uh, within Latin America. So the governments of these foreign countries would support the, their own companies, um, interests within Latin America. And that's really, like I said, neocolonialism kind of is, was the res or kind of resulted in Latin America being politically free in some sense, because now people who were born there are ruling, but they had just kind of filled in the old void, uh, and instead we see a lot of the economic, the people who are, are gaining the most economically are foreigners, again, um, oftentimes in Europe or the United States, just like uh, colonialism before. So Latin America, politically free-ish, uh, economically kind of dependent, and Thus why there's still a lot of turbulence there today, um, you know, and why even today, you know, the U.S. still, and the U.S. and other countries still kind of meddle in, um, in those areas because of neocolonialism. With that, we'll end there. Um, this is Greg signing off.